Welcome to Club E. Hi, I'm Rick Brimacombe of Brimacombe Associates. I am your architect of business growth and will work with you to unlock your potential and amplify the scale of your company. Today, we're discussing strategize this, boost your brand identity coming out of COVID and now the recent riots around the country. I wanna thank our sponsors, Irish Titan, an e-commerce and web development firm, Boulay Group, CPAs and advisors, Highland Bank, a locally owned community bank, Romaine Berg, a digital marketing agency, Minnesota Sales, a sales acceleration firm, and the Network Connect, a catalytic gateway for growing your company. But first, before we get started, I'd like you to subscribe and like our Clubby channel. You just uh, need to take a moment, I'll wait for you. We could use your help. So again, click the subscribe button down below the video. It's gonna help us deliver better content to you, our wonderful audience, and let you know when our sessions are going live. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Rashini Rajkumar, and uh, welcome Rashini. Thanks, Rick, thanks for having me. Yeah, and Rashini's contact info is uh, gonna be in the comments field. Um, as uh, is uh, an opportunity to ask some questions. But before we get to that, uh, Rashini, tell us a little bit about yourself, your firm, the background, the various things that you're up to. Yeah, so my company is Rashini Performance Group and it's uh, 14 and a half years now that I've had my business. I'm an executive coach, mainly C-suite executives, but other strategic leaders. I'm also a professional speaker and talk show host. Some people may know my show on WCCO Radio, Real Talk with Rashini. But my past life was as a television news reporter. So that was my first career. And a lot of prepping clients now is very much inspired by that past life in TV news and my current life in media as a commentator and talk show host. So I'm always thinking about the various layers of audiences that see and hear and read about what you're doing. I do happen to be a licensed attorney, though I don't practice, but my understanding of liability comes into play pretty much for all clients. And definitely when I was doing a story as a, a reporter and now as a talk show host, I am definitely trying to prevent myself or my station from getting sued. So liability is always re relevant and prevalent in those things. And the work that I do, you know, I should say that having covered tragedies and murders and controversial topics in my past. For example, if you may recall the Firestone tires blowing up. I was in Nashville at the time at the CBS television station. I was at those press conferences where we were grilling, and that's the word to use, the various leadership of Bridgestone Americas to find out what happened with those tires. So knowing that I was someone who did that and asked those kinds of questions, now I, I bring some of that skill set to the table when I'm prepping my own clients for their own work. And let's hope they don't have to ever go through a Firestone tire situation, but we can all learn from those kinds of experiences. And when I was in TV news, I did some talk radio, whether there was get, being a guest on our sister radio stations, promoting sweeps pieces. Uh, and I really fell in love with the medium of radio, which so uses the audio, the vocal and the vocal behavior. So when I started my business in 2006, it was part of my business plan to one day have my own radio show. And uh, that just doesn't happen overnight. But in August of 2012, I got my own show on WCCO Radio in Minneapolis. It streams all over the world. And then last year, 2019, as part of kind of my real talk and really being real, uh, I launched the Real Leaders with Rashini podcast, which uh, are terrific 15 to 20 minute conversations with leaders from all different industries, walks of life, generations, and uh, you can find it on most uh, of the popular podcast platforms. But Rick, it's really been a joy to do that podcast because I learned so many of the best practices, and it's really meant to be an inspirational and lifestyle podcast more than a leadership podcast, but we get a lot of great leadership tips out of it from talking to Super Bowl champions, to CEOs of different companies, to the two teenage siblings who started the Not Okay app. So it's wonderful uh, that that has become part of my day-to-day -day working life. Yep, and obviously can hear in the, the passion in your voice that uh, you have a real love for that. I do, thanks. 
Yeah, and uh, little did we know when we set this up a couple of weeks ago that uh, the world would be a vastly different place. So the topic we're covering today um, is very fitting. So thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And, you know, it already was going to be jam packed talking about how do we come out of COVID and the stay at home orders. And, uh, you know, it pretty much multiplied by 100 or more uh, since uh, we set this date. And I appreciate you with us because I know you've been busy and been jumping um, to various activities. So, again, thanks for uh, keeping it uh, with us and then also for sharing your insights uh, at this moment in time, which is very valuable. So uh, before we get to our event, I wanna talk about how our audience, you folks can participate in what you receive for that. So our hashtag today is to be own your all, which is uh, one of the web domains for Rashini and her various business. Two winners are gonna receive a complimentary strategy communication session with uh, Rashini, a $500 value. In addition, all the participants who enter that hashtag today are gonna receive a gift of communication from Rashini and that is her third edition, Communicate That Book. And again, anybody wants to participate or get a copy of the book, put in your questions and the hashtag is own your wow. Uh, we'll send a message after today's live stream to give folks an information uh, and how they can access the uh, book. So again, it's hashtag own your wow. Two winners are gonna be chosen for that Stratcom session with, with Rashini. And given all that we're going through, it's gonna be more valuable than ever uh, right now. So again, thanks for your participation. So when we started uh, talking about this a couple of weeks ago, as you said, you know, COVID was all the talk. Um, and let's just start there. Um, what can we learn or what can our audience learn about the COVID crisis and how to take that into future crisis readiness? Right, so many lessons to be had by COVID because there are a lot of audiences that we're thinking about. And I think more than almost any crisis in recent memory that's affected us at a national and even global level, companies have to think about their leadership teams, they have to think about their employees, and they have to think about both all of the internal and external audiences they have. So what are some of those external audiences? your customers, your prospective customers, the media, your backers, your board of directors. And even though the board technically is on your side, they're also kind of an outside audience uh, and others are going to be looking to you. Or if you're not a corporation, maybe it is a, a, a kind of an informal board of advisors. Those are some of those external um, audiences you need to think about. So this crisis, the pandemic, really hit us on all levels. It hit our health it hit our safety, and it hit our economic bottom line. So unless you've got a plan for each of those three things, it's going to be very difficult to come out of any of them, right? And different industries and different companies have different ways of responding. Now, I want to share some thoughts from the CEO of, G of uh, HB Fuller, Jim Owens. I happened to hear him speak just yesterday at the first Thursday, first Tuesday event that Carlson School of Management at the U of M put on. And it was a Zoom session. They usually do it in person, but it was Zoom. And I was taking copious notes because this leader who I don't know personally, was really sharing some best practices. And I kept thinking to myself, I love this, I love this, I have to share it with Rick's audience on Wednesday. And one thing he said is that in times of crisis, government may help the situation, they may enable, they may disable. And we've seen some of that lately with our riots in Minneapolis and other parts of the country. But businesses need to step up. So in times of crisis, I love it businesses need to step up. And Jim Owens said that, and the main fixer for the stepping up is trust. So if there's trust in the organization, you can really handle health, safety, and economic issues. An example he shared with HB Fuller is 12% of their business is in China. And instead of trying to manage the crisis from headquarters in St. Paul, they trusted their leadership in China to run the China operation. And to that end, no Chinese employer, employer, employee in China, China, whether they were Chinese or otherwise, no employee in China was infected with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So that tells me a lot of different things. He spoke very well of what the team did in containment and safety and messaging. All of those things come into play. So I am never going to be one to advise, you know, going into 
uh, a hole and burying your head. You can't. And if you are running a company and you have other people's lives depending on you and their livelihoods, you absolutely need to have a game plan. Yep. Uh, and then as uh, you look back over your career, you've had so many interesting experience, um, whether you're on camera, uh, off camera, on the radio, coaching, you know, you go to these sessions like you heard yesterday. As you look back, are there specific examples that come to mind when you think of companies that either navigated a crisis well or maybe uh, a little bit more on the portly side? All right, let's start with really well. This is my favorite example when I get asked this. We're going back to the 80s. So, you know, some of your viewers might have been, you know, kids or teens at that time. I was a young person myself. The Chicago Tylenol murders, if you remember those. Yeah. 1982, McNeil Consumer Products, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, manufactured them. And mysteriously, people, some people were dying, including kids, and they called them the Tylenol murders. And to their credit, they were active. They did a recall of their product, like a mass recall across, you know, wherever they had that product, and they put out mass warnings. So they really put those warnings out into the media. They weren't looking to put the blame on anyone else. They valued human life first. So there's that health and security issue. So to this day, this has become a case study, Rick, in a lot of business schools, in a lot of crisis management programs, the Tylenol reaction by that company. Uh, T uh, PBS did a special on it. I recommend people watch that and get some of the nuances. You can see some old footage. I believe it was Ed Bradley at 60 Minutes. But at the end of the day, they offered a reward for anyone who had information leading to the arrest of the perpetrators. They gave you replacement capsules if you think you had some contaminated goods. Those were all really good things that they did. And the last I checked, and you may have new information, they still have had not captured the people who actually perpetrated that. But Tylenol was a winner in a, in a dark time for that uh, company and manufacturer. That is definitely a good story. Mm -hmm. And then of on, crisis uh, management. Yeah. yeah. And then on uh, similarly flip side of that coin is uh, companies that maybe didn't do as good of a job. All right, well, two come really right at the top of my list, and I have video on the website on our videos page. You can hear me talking about some of these in detail if you want to learn more about them and how to not be them. If you remember United in 2017, uh, yanked a passenger or employees yanked a passenger, uh, dragged him. He was bloodied, screaming uh, because he refused to get off the plane. They dragged him off the, uh, out of his seat. And the CEO at the time, Oscar Munoz, uh, really didn't do a good job in that first communication. And this is the thing, you have certain touch points of where you really need to be strategic and effective. And in his very first response, he said, we had to accommodate customers and, and one was disruptive. I mean, that is just not the response to give. He doubled down later and came back out after he himself had seen the video. And then he said it was a horrible uh, event. The stock price dropped that, you know, by the next day by 4% for United. And we've all learned a lot. And we've also seen since 2017 how much more video has come into play. Um, there's probably going to be a video around if there's bad behavior. So you've got to think about that for all your employees uh, when they act and if they decide to be angry in how they react with customers. So that's one. And then the Lululemon is always my favorite to bring up. This is where who you choose as your brand ambassador is so important. So the CEO at the time, and this kind of spans 2013, then there was a reassertion of this with the yoga pants in 2018, the yoga pants that were too, th too thin. If the founder and chairman, Chip Wilson, had just let his CEO speak, perhaps they wouldn't have gone into the crisis that they did and we're still talking about it in 2020. But what he said is perhaps some women shouldn't wear our yoga pants. That is not the thing to say in the modern age, whether you believe it or not, that's just not the right thing to say. And if you truly have some crisis and strategic communication, coaching and training, you would never let something like that come out of your mouth, let alone from the chairman and the founder of the organization. Yeah, uh, not good. Not good. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely not good. Right. We can all agree that was a leadership fail. 
Yeah, a uh, big fail, capital letters. All right, uh, so again, uh, for folks that wanna participate with questions, please put those in the comments field, subscribe and like our uh, channel. The hashtag today is own your wow. Again, hashtag own your wow. Get a uh, Stratcom session with Rashini, uh, as well as a book for everybody who participates. Um, all right, so first question from Alex, um, and then this ties in kind of the second crisis that we're going through. We're now dealing with two crises. We have COVID-19 and the aftermath of George Floyd's death. How should a brand navigate these two serious but distinct phenomena over the next, he wrote in his question, 60 days, but maybe there's also a, you know, kind of near-term, long-term uh, perspective if, if they're different. Yeah, I really like Alex's adding in the 60 days because with any crisis, you've got to have a short, midterm and long-term plan. So I would say right now you need your kind of 10 to day to two week plan, then your 60 day and then stretch out over the rest of the year. What are you going to do? So really figuring out like these are two topics you don't want to interlace too much. So we, we talked about how with COVID we have health issues, we have safety concerns, we have economic concerns. Well, now with the violence in the Minneapolis area, across the country, across the globe, we, we, you kind of have to list what you have. There are also safety issues there that any organization has to be thinking about. There are clear uh, inclusion issues. So what are, what are your practices and policies when it comes to inclusion and some of those uh, workplace issues? So workplace laws you need to be thinking about. And so all of these areas, you know, they overlap a little bit, but not really. So before you start getting overwhelmed that you have two major crises, you know, in literally two within three months and now happening um, at the same time, break it down into the different areas. So kind of give yourself that checklist. Where are we with security on this? Our building, our people. Where are we with open forums for discussion and things like that, which is really needed with the racial issues and the controversial injustices that many are feeling, but yet we also have protection issues that need to be talked about. So really opening up those lines of communication, the best thing leadership can do is be transparent and also don't second guess your, guess your leaders. If you have other leaders that are direct managers of teams with numbers of people on them, let them do their thing and you will come out at least, if not ahead, you'll at least come out not in a crisis or very lightly touched by these two crises happening at the same time. And then just uh, curious, I'm, I'm imagining your phone and, and emails are blowing up uh, given everybody's kind of struggling with this issue right now. Yes, absolutely. I am, you know, this week I'm dealing, since last week I'm dealing with a few different things. And, and you know, even if it's a different kind of an issue. So for example, there might be someone out there that's dealing with uh, an employee issue but in our, and they may have nothing to do with any of the violence or the riots that are going on in the Twin Cities or in Chicago or New York or DC, but they might be in a place where because this is the, the current zeitgeist, they are going to have to deal with issues of race and gender and workplace issues that perhaps their own crisis doesn't blow up uh, to get to that level, but because it's happening in a climate where those topics are being discussed, they have to be ready for them. So it is a really good time to check in with whoever advises you on things like this. If your lawyers are not enough, you know, a crisis coach is definitely a good way to go. Just even to look at messaging. Uh, often I will look at statements before clients send them to the media, or if they got uh, questions, they want responses, they want written responses sent back. I'll look at those questions to make sure there's not an inflammatory language in there. So the thing that's a challenge, Rick, in our climate, in 2020 and beyond, and this has really been the case for the last decade or so, you can't just rest on your laurels. You can't just say, well, we put this out there on our website. So we're, it's all good now. You've got to be thinking about your website. You've got to be thinking about all your social digital plat platforms. You have to also be thinking of anyone who's connected to your brand and has the power to speak for your brand. All of those 
entities, all those avenues need to be in some sort of alignment or it is a crisis waiting to happen for you. Yeah, especially in the world we're in with uh, all that's going on and the role of social media. And actually that leads to another question, a good one from uh, Aaron, uh, talks about the uh, uh, difference between sincerity and opportunity in your crisis messaging. What are your thoughts on trying to balance those two issues in um, a, a time like, like we're in right now? That is such a great question from Aaron, because here's the thing, uh, you know, that saying, don't let a good crisis get away from you. The thing that you can do in crisis is look at it as a, as a flashpoint to really look at all of your messaging, look at all of your policies and figure out if they are truly in alignment authentically with what the founders or how your, your business mission and values are and what do they say and could they clash with what's happening in the outside world? That's how you start to judge the difference between the sincerity and the opportunity in crisis. You also have to stay authentic and consistent. So if you're changing every week or every month your message, that's also going to be very suspect. So you really want to stick with some of your branding words, be authentic, don't try to be someone else. If someone else has a great commercial they put out, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. I mean, let's look at all the COVID commercials that are out there, right? Now they're turning into kind of what's called white noise. I don't even really watch them anymore because they have no meaning anymore. So that's what you really have to ask yourself if you are going to jump on messaging that's connected to a specific crisis. Yeah, I'm seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of ads from companies that I don't really understand where they're going with the ad or why they're even doing it. And so, um, I don't know, there is a lot of noise. Yeah, I, I don't, I didn't ever think I'd say this, Rick, but I'm sort of missing political ads in, a, in an election year because we're seeing <laughs> so many of these other kinds that now are sort of just falling off your radar because uh, they're mimicking and they're, they don't seem as sincere to me as the weeks go on. Yeah. So speaking of um, kind of the, the time uh, that we're in right now, chaos, noise, uh, people putting ads out there that aren't in the norm, stuff you're not used to seeing. How do you get your, your audience or people to listen to your message when you're in an environment like we're in right now? Yeah, that is and can be very difficult. This is where I really focus in on audience analysis. So you can't be all things to all prospective clients or all consumers, but you can identify who do you want to hear you. And I would imagine those are your current customers, those are your possible future customers, perhaps the media, but maybe not. I think first and foremost, you've got to think about who are the stakeholders that are going to keep this company going and that are going to, you know, when I'm always big on the long game. Who's going to be with us for the long game? And we need to think about those audiences and message to them. So if it's going to turn them off to use some cliches or some cute little mascots, that's not the way to go. You've got to really understand who your audience is or your audiences are, and then message what I call powerfully perform, then choreograph your message. And in an authentic way, this isn't acting. It's really planning, choreographing in an authentic way that will hit how your audiences need to hear you, see you, perceive you, and feel you. Okay. So let's pivot a little bit away from the crisis communication. Obviously, a lot of talk about there, and uh, we can have you back maybe uh, down the road a little bit and, and look backward at some of the stuff that happened. But if we just talk about more communications in general and branding, how many spokespeople should a brand have? You know, that will depend somewhat on the size of the company. And I think a lot of times people think the CEO, the owner, the founder is that person. And that is fine if it is that person, but we also need to make sure that person is ready for all the different kinds of ways they may have to message. 
Is it TV? Is it radio? Is it in, in print or online giving quotes? How savvy are they at that? I'm also a big fan of letting content experts be some of those brand ambassadors. So in most, there's not really one number. Sometimes I say once you get more than three brand ambassadors, you're getting, you're clouding things. But if someone truly is the expert in, you know, the way a wing and uh, an airplane wing glides through the sky, there's no reason the CEO needs to talk. If they say, look, we're going to have the person who creates these, designs these, speak on behalf of us. So as long as it's very clear why whoever is out there is the brand ambassador, then I think you can have more than two or three. But it is very important that all of them are in alignment with one another. They're in alignment with what the leadership is thinking needs to be done. And also what is legal. You know, we need to be thinking about what is legal because you also don't want to put yourself out there on a liability limb if someone is going to shoot off their mouth. I mean, an example of someone who I'm sure his board gets some challenges with is Elon Musk. And we've seen a lot of things that he does. He has such a big following. Uh, I think it was 2019 that some of his tweets were causing stock prices, you know, the, the potential. He said he was going to go public. He wasn't. I mean, all these different kinds of things, you know, when, when you're trying to do real business things coming out of COVID trying to deal with the current situation. You don't need people shooting off their mouths. So that's first and foremost, is whoever those brand ambassadors are, that you really vet them, you make them feel comfortable. I've had clients come to me for media coaching because they are asked for media interviews, but they don't feel they have the right people who are ready to speak. And then they're losing that opportunity for some free media airtime right? So you do, in most situations, when the narrative is good, you do want to be able to have a spokesperson to speak to the media or to speak to internal and external audiences. It's not always the media, but when you have specific targeted audiences, you also want the right people in front of them. I'd say a little bit of an odd question, but it, it came to mind when you see brands like Geico with the lizard and Ronald McDon or McDonald's with Ronald McDonald. Talk maybe just a, a little bit about having um, a, a caricature or a character or whatever as part of a brand. Just kind of curious your thoughts on that. Well, I happen to love that little lizard for Geico to the point where I don't really, I don't have Geico insurance. I'll never get Geico insurance, but I love that lizard, right? Or the gecko. Uh, and you know, he keeps people talking. He keeps them front and center. I don't know what their market share is. I can imagine they're doing pretty well because those are some expensive ads to create that campaign. But sometimes, it, you know, that's an example, Rick, of you, not everyone can do it. So you've got Allstate with the Mayhem character. You've got Ge the Gecko for Geico. And then you've got Flow for Progressive. And you can tell other brands are trying to find their Gecko. And it doesn't always work. So you've got to really be authentic and creative if you're going to do something like that. And as far as the Ronald McDonald, you know, here's the challenge when you have a beloved character like that, that I grew up with and definitely before me, and they've changed and jiggered Ronald a little bit. He does look different and sometimes even a little more clownish versus this kind of loving character that represents the brand. So you've got to also look at, is there a time to end some of those figures and completely rebrand? And I'm not a big fan of just rebranding for the sake of rebranding, but you have to look at who your audiences are, what is speaking to them, and what's going to make them stick with your brand. Okay, thanks for uh, that. Just curious on my side. Say on Club E here, we try to talk a lot about uh, examples, um, whether they're good or bad, uh, as a way for the business folks in the audience to learn. As you look at uh, communication, um, what do you think is the biggest mistake uh, when it comes to strategic communications that, that in general companies make? Well, number one, it's not having a plan. 
Because if you think you're going to just sail through and never have a controversial situation arise in the workplace between two employees or maybe between a boss and an employee, or if you think you're not going to get some sort of complaint on your social media, if you think you're not going to get an email that's negative, that's then shared with the media, whether it was correct or incorrect, you're living on a, in a bubble because it could happen, it probably will happen. It's how you react and how strong your customer service is that really keeps the winners alive, right? So what I would say is have a plan. Don't keep that plan just tightly held with leadership. Make sure that everyone knows that plan and uh, be willing to adjust if you need to. So flexibility also needs to be in there as long as it doesn't stray from your company's ethics and values. Okay. And then I guess the flip side of that coin as uh, str strategic communication goes, what maybe makes up the elements of a good plan? Assuming there is a plan, if there were one, two, three things that, that you think companies should have, what, uh, what should be included? So that there are some made, you know, very agreed upon and major themes or messaging points. And then you asked me about the brand ambassadors. We all know who's going to speak. So if someone is called, they can say, you know what? I need to send this over to Joe's department because that's who's going to speak on this. And then it's very clear. Everyone in the organization knows who to send those kinds of inquiries to. So you got the messaging. Everyone agrees. They align with values. You know who the messengers are. And then you need to listen. You need to listen to the feedback you're getting and understand that you may have to pivot. So sort of going hand in hand, Rick, with your question about the biggest mistake, not having a plan is absolutely the biggest mistake, but then not planning for the pivot. And this is what I spend a lot of my time with my clients, coaching them about how to plan for the pivot. So that is directly connected with how well you do your audience analysis, planning for that audience, and then once you go into the communication setting, if you're seeing that they're not following you or it's not going according to plan, we need to pivot into plan B, C, or D so that we can accomplish our intent. And intent is very important. You have to have an intent with whatever communication endeavor you're doing. If you go into it with no focused intent, then nobody knows what they're doing. Not your audience, not you. So you've got to drive that intent line, I call it. What's your intent line for any communication moment, whether it's an email, a press conference, a speech, a sales meeting, or even a memo you're sending to the entire company? What is my intent for this? And who's the audience? Who's reading this? Who's watching it? Who's listening? How will they take it in? That is so important. And if it's a live thing where there's an opportunity to pivot versus a written message, you have to be ready for that pivot. And those who are ready for the pivot, there are a lot of wonderful examples in sport. You have seen some of the greatest athletes. They may have a plan, but they're agile enough, flexible enough to pivot when different game plans or different people are thrown at them or different plays are thrown at them. And that's what makes the most successful outcome. Great. All right. So, um, We've, we've talked about brand ambassadors a couple of times, touched on it anyway. Uh, they're becoming more and more important. Uh, first of all, for our audience, uh, define what a brand ambassador is and how an organization can enlist uh, said brand ambassadors. So a couple levels on this, Rick. So everyone that's connected to a brand is a brand ambassador. So for example, my team, Rashini Performance Group, I have a small team. They are all brand ambassadors for my company. They are not speaking on behalf of the company. I am the one who speaks on behalf of the company. So there's that separation. But everyone is a brand ambassador. So everyone who works for Nike, for Patagonia, for Lunds and Byerly's, for Cub Foods, everyone has the potential, every employee, to be a brand ambassador. That's why it's important that they take that seriously and leadership empowers them to have, you know, make a good living be clean, dress well, have uniforms that make sense if uniforms are part of your world. Then it's important to understand that we actually have brand ambassadors who are also spokespeople. So that's where we're getting at how many should be spokespeople on behalf of the organization. Then you have the ability to enlist brand ambassadors who are not employed by the company, 
But for example, it's one of my goals that my clients are raving fans of mine. I'm their secret weapon. So if I am working a crisis, I'm not going to tell you whose crisis I'm working on. I'm their secret weapon. If they want to share that with someone that I'm their coach, they can. But it's my goal to get them through the crisis or if they're not in crisis to prepare to avoid a crisis. But my goal is that no matter what, at every stage of this, they trust me, they put their faith in me, and I and they are raving fans of how I am coaching them. So now for my brand, those clients become brand ambassadors. I recently received a new client who was referred by another client who's a lawyer. And that client has been a client of mine in the past. Now she's become a friend. She has used me for some of her different clients when crisis comes into uh, the situation. And that's the case for actually many of my clients. They will send their people or their friends or their uh, spouse to me because they know this is what I do. So all of those people who are talking about your brand are your brand ambassadors. So that's kind of the global brand ambassador. This is why it's so important, Rick, when you're in crisis, people that you don't even know are watching you, are watching you, or waiting to see how you react to something. And I don't want you to be paranoid, but I want you to take that seriously. Because as a thriving member of any community, as a business leader, as an employee, as a member of the media, all of us have a role to play to strengthen the community and strengthen our brands. But people are watching and it's surprising how many are watching. It sometimes hits you at weird moments that someone saw what you said, heard what you said, saw what you did or read what you wrote. And so I, I want you to think about that before you press send or post on that social media post or before you send that email uh, that maybe uh, has some inflammatory words in it, really think about it, really read through it. All right, so we've got a bunch of uh, questions coming through. Again, hashtag on your wow, get an access to uh, Roshini's new book. Uh, you get into trying to have a free Stratcom session with her um, as well as get her contact information. Um, and then lastly, don't forget to hit subscribe and like to the Clubby channel. All right, um, from Alex, another question. How can companies be ready for multiple and completely unpredictable circumstances? And he asked about a disaster plan, which I think your answer is gonna be yes. Should everybody have a disaster plan on the shelf? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know what a disaster is for each of us and for each brand has now gotten new definitions in 2020, right? Um, what I saw a tweet yesterday, you know, just think it was only a couple of days ago that we were in Minnesota. We were bummed because the Minnesota State Fair was is canceled this year. Now that seems like so long ago and such little care because of what we're dealing with. So having that plan in place, but also identifying for yourself, Alex and everyone, what does disaster mean for you? Is disaster that the company just crumbles? Is disaster that you could get caught up in some of the violence that's happening in the cities and streets of America right now? Identify what the disaster is, have a plan, bring your leadership together, be transparent. Employees might not be part of the decision-making process, but maybe you need to solicit ideas from them. You know, I'll tell you that every day of our lockdown, I'll use an example of the general manager of uh, my radio company, Entercom in Minneapolis has three stations, WCC Radio, Jack FM and Wolf FM. And Shannon, who is our GM of all three, every day sent a morning huddle to all employees. And even if it, some days it was slim, you know, uh, thin, some days it was thick, but we all had the same information as much as she could give us that she knew from corporate or other things locally. So those kinds of things are important. You wanna make sure that that doesn't turn into white noise. So you do wanna say something new each time if you're doing that daily or weekly. I have some clients that do regular videos to employees and that's something that you can do internally. It's also something you can put out on your Facebook channels if you want the public to have access to those kinds of messages. So at the end of the day, if you have been a consistent communicator and your brand is open, your brand is not afraid, your brand does not act defensively, then when a disaster happens, you have the benefit of the doubt from the community 
community and your other stakeholders. If you've never participated in public discourse and there's a disaster and now you're jumping out and saying different things that make no sense, then there will be suspicions that you are trying to take advantage of the crisis. So it's really important that you're clear in all of those definitions. Yeah, so that leads into a couple of other uh, questions from the audience from Katie. Uh, is there a strategy to be silent? Katie, what a great question. Wow. Yes, that can be a strategy. And sometimes it's a timing thing. So you have to, as you're watching a crisis, and I'm tracking a couple right now where I'm watching um, what people do, and I, whether I'm involved in the crisis uh, coaching or not, I kind of have my, you know, what I would say if I were coaching, when they should speak, because sometimes you have to see where all the noise plays out, how it plays out, will other people come and support you as a brand ambassador, will they not, and then make that decision about timing whether you should speak. You've got to ask yourself, how public is our brand? How many people are touched by what we do? And does it hurt us to say nothing? Now, you may be silent, Katie, I don't know what size your organization is. You may be silent to the public and the media, but maybe you have 10 customers you should give a personal call to and talk through the situation. I will always recommend something like that, but do it on a day that you're calm, you're not emotional, you're able to ask for, you know, if they have questions, you have time to respond. So sometimes those can be very case by case. Okay, so kind of along the same lines, another interesting question um, about uh, communicating less, not more. From Jeff, uh, in all honesty, I've been communicating less with all the competing noise out there. How can you encourage people like me to stay engaged in my external communications? Jeff, I'm a big believer of less is more. And right now you're, you're actually very right on the money when it comes to less communication. If you choose to speak or communicate, and again, I don't know if you're the boss or if you're an employee, if you have a team, it's important to communicate to those who need to hear from you, but that might not be the public at large. That might not be every team in an organization. And you know, maybe it's just the one or two people that you're regularly dealing with or a couple of vendors or clients, but it is not a bad strategy. I, I'm a big believer of less is more. In fact, more is more is rarely appropriate. And right now we're getting inundated. I, I just in my own inbox, because I'm a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School, uh, I've received so many messages and I want to hear from them. I know they need to speak but I've received messages from various different places at the University of Minnesota. And that's fine, but think about it. Every organization, every business, you wanna get that message out there so your customers know that you care. Well, keep it short. It doesn't need to be this much of, you know, solid paragraphs of black ink on, on paper or on email. Keep it tight, keep it sincere, and keep it human, right? These are the times that it is okay to say, we are struggling with what's going on around us. And we think you might be too. We're here for you. Here's our phone number. Here's our website. Here are our social platforms. Right there, I just scripted you a message. If that's appropriate for your brand, use my words. You can take them because I would rather get that kind of an email from certain brands than this much on the email, which just is exhausts me. I either delete it or leave it to read later and then never return to it. Sure. So tying back to uh, the COVID and tough economy and people having to, to strike out on their own, question from Clint, what advice around branding and identity for those who may be starting a new venture at this time, frankly, more out of necessity because of job loss or anticipated job loss, um, um, and is that any different than, say, doing it from an opportunistic standpoint? Clint, right now, you are in an interestingly strategic situation. And I say interestingly, because I'm not wishing this on you, buddy, I'm not. But if you can maximize this opportunity that you have, you are going to come out ahead. I don't know the industry you're in, but everything from now moving forward is going to be so majorly digital. 
So if you can find all the digital ways to connect with new customers, because if you're new, I'm assuming you don't have any currently, but even getting your message out, get your digital platforms, take the time and less is more. You don't need to be everywhere. Choose a couple digital platforms that you want to focus in on. Make them full of quality, full of valuable content for your clients and your prospective clients and learn how to make sure we can access you easily on our handheld devices, easily in an on-demand way. And you're going to be able to use this advice strategically right now. It might mean that you need help. If you're not a digital technician, you might need that support. And I know Club E has some of those supporters as their sponsors, so you don't have to look very far. But at the end of the day, this could be the beginning of something really great. I don't want you to be tone deaf to some of the sadness and anger that's going on around you. So keep that in mind, monitor that, and decide what your game plan will be. Yeah, and actually, I mean, we've had to do it here at Club E with uh, going digital and not the in-person. And um, But what uh, we have found is it allows us to dive into uh, topics in a greater detail like this. And so um, I've uh, viewed this as a blessing to explore this a little bit like you go in your podcast after doing radio for a while. And so um, it's been a good opportunity. And for folks that can uh, see um, the proverbial silver lining and, and like you say, figure out how they can fit in a digital universe, um, I do agree it's a, a great opportunity. Actually posted a piece on LinkedIn a while back. Um, one of my favorite things I learned, um, actually Shakespeare uh, wrote several plays during the plague of 1606 uh, when he was locked up. So uh, it's a good time to uh, be reinventing yourself. It All really, right. really is. I've been trying to work on the second book for a long time, and I feel like that's what I need to have coming out of COVID is my second book. So we'll okay. see. <laughs> All right. So a um, couple more questions here. Um, again, hashtag own your wow. Um, this one goes back to the question about the international um, businesses and, and hearing the H.B. Fuller example that, that you gave. I think it's kind of interesting. When you trust your overseas locations and they begin to show signs of struggling, at what point does HQ leadership intervene? And probably the question doesn't necessarily even have international. It could be, hey, you're, you're, you're at uh, the higher levels of an organization. You have your team supposed to be doing stuff at some point in time, different people in that team may be struggling. When does, when does a business leader intervene? Yeah, I think you have to remain communicative with everyone, whether that means a town hall that you can do, and now you do that by Zoom and you're gonna get a lot of people. If you have identified the parties that you're questioning, it's important that you privately communicate with them, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three, whatever it is, and ask the questions, ask them, do you need something? Do you need help? We are not judging you. We just need to understand the situation. So at a very high level, that headquarter leadership really needs to be asking those tough questions. And look, anytime headquarter leadership is reaching out to someone lower level or someone out of country or out of state, it, it, it's nervous for that employee, but you've got to do it. You've got to find the right person, just like audience analysis we talked about today. Who are those leaders or people you're questioning? Who's the best messenger to have that conversation with those people you're questioning? It might not be the CEO, it might be, but if it's someone else, have them have that conversation, be very clear. Don't assume that it's going to just fix itself after one conversation or one exchange. So be ready for follow-up. I'm a big fan of, if it's done right, I'm a big fan of leadership doing some sort of, whether it is a, a two minute employee video just to keep everyone on the same page or a town hall where questions can be asked directly and honestly of leadership. I'm a fan of that because the other side of this, you know, I'm thinking as a licensed attorney, is liability. And you, if you are the boss or the organization, you want to make sure you're giving all employees a chance to be heard and that you don't end up in your own liability mess because you didn't get some of that feedback from your employees. So town halls and uh, open forums or chat rooms where they can ask the boss questions, those are going to be good things for them. 
Great segue, uh, Marcini, into our next question, um, actually from Darren Lynch. Uh, Darren is a sponsor, Irish Titan, longtime supporter of Club E. Um, for visible leaders like Darren and other folks within an organization, and you just mentioned a couple of ways they could hear from their uh, employees and, and the participants in their team, but how uh, do visible uh, leaders make sure that, that they best are speaking on behalf of everyone um, and as the company as a whole. A little tougher for um, folks that are used to being in front and, and used to you know, taking a lot of um, the image of the company around this strong person. Um, and how do they manage uh, this listening to everybody and, and speaking um, as a, as a, one voice, I guess, for the whole company. Yeah, it's 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 kind of a multi-part thing that that Darren gets us into here. So you've got to have those open forums to receive the information from all levels, all employees, but you also have to be the one to communicate. This is what we're going to say. So maybe it's a heads up by an hour or two if a statement is going out. Maybe it's, hey, I really want to do a Twitter campaign. And I know Darren and Irish Titan are very active on social media. Maybe it's, hey, I, the leader, I want to do a Twitter campaign. What are some best practices, great ideas coming in from the employees of, of a regular weekly or every other day message we can put out there and or pictures or images of us or you know, maybe we do have a diverse workforce and we want to highlight that at this time, not in a cheesy way, but that's where an Instagram or a Twitter or Facebook page comes in where you just, you're not saying we have a diverse workforce. You're just, you're consistently having images of your diverse workforce out there uh, for public display. And I will point out uh, a little, uh, promotion of Darren. Darren was in season one of Real Leaders with Rashini podcast. You can check that out from summer 20, late summer 2019 uh, on your favorite podcast app. Okay. And then again, uh, Rashini's contact info will be in the comments field. Um, and the hashtag is on your wow. Another question from Aaron. We talked a little bit about the branding earlier. How often is too often to change your brand messaging? Well, you, you don't want to do it a lot, you know, and it depends on what you're talking about when you say brand messaging. So if it's overall visuals and buzzwords or things like that, I mean, just do it from Nike has stuck because they haven't changed it, right? So thinking about what kind of, if you are rebranding, what's the shelf life on any kind of saying or logo or, or a motto? Is it going to go out of fashion? Is it going to run out of, you know, have a, a, a date on it? You don't want things that might seem like they're a fad or a trend, but I would recommend against doing that too often. And if you are going to make changes, there has to be a very big intent behind it, a reason why. What's my intent for doing this? What's our intent for rebranding at this moment? And then you can accomplish some messages that kind of deal with current events without fully changing your brand by coming up with mini campaigns across certain platforms or a special commercial that goes out. Or maybe you do some radio or TV interviews that are about some events you're going to do. And that's the way to kind of keep some sort of life and new life without doing a major brand overhaul. So you've touched on Rashini a couple of times, um, different uh, communications, there's internal and external. Um, talk a little bit uh, of the, the differences actually between the two. And then question I have is one more important than the other. No, they're both so important. It's really hard to, to say that one is more important than the other. I mean, you've got to be thinking of internal and external at all times. So your internal are those employees, you know, for the most part, your employees. And in a way, your vendors are a blend of that internal and external, depending on your organization and how much interplay you have with some of those vendors. Of course, your clients are external, but you know, your client could also be a vendor. I mean, you know, there are all these different things. Your board is also kind of a blend. The media, definitely an external uh, 
part, that's an external audience. If you're a nonprofit, then any of your donors or prospective donors are external. So it's if you don't know, if you've never done an audience assessment, uh, it's a good time to do it. Who are our internal stakeholders? Who are the external stakeholders? And what's our intent? I, I, I write about and teach the IAP formula to all of my clients. And for those who do the hashtag own your wow, you're going to get my book. The IAP is in full detail in that book and in a lot of the things I do, but that I say, once you identify your list of who your audience is, do an IAP on each of those audiences. So you truly understand if your intent line is where it needs to be for each of those audiences. All right. Um, let's see, as we kind of aim towards the finish line here um, on our talk today, again, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, if you uh, had to leave our audience with kind of one key takeaway, um, whether you want to reinforce something that we touched on or maybe there's something that we've missed today, uh, what would be kind of the one takeaway or, or nugget you'd like to leave our audience with? They sort of go hand in hand in everything that I do myself as well as teach. And that is be intentional, no matter what you're going to do, have an intent and be authentic. So my kind of fun example of that is if, if you're funny, use humor. If you're not funny, don't try it. Don't try telling jokes on stage. Don't, it's not your friend. Humor will not be your friend if you're not funny. So understand who you are as a communicator and really understand your brand and then be intentional with that and be authentic. And if you do those things, even if you run into some bumps or a true crisis, your record will show that you are authentic and you're going to have a better road fixing whatever mess or bump that you got into. Okay. Say, so, um, uh, you've had a, an interesting career, TV, radio, podcast, coaching, um, lots of, of different uh, things that, that I'm sure were wonderful in their own right. As you look back over your career, was there some lesson that you, you found to be um, very important or, or critical that maybe you wish you could have learned sooner? Well, the real easy one is like save more money. Like, save. I wish I had saved more in my younger days. But, you know, everything I do really is trying to fortify and support and help others with this own your wow concept. I believe everyone has differentiators that should be valued that can bring really good things to the world. It starts though with you owning what that wow is. And I would say that I've learned over the years that mine is that I really care about how we communicate, how we communicate to end up in an intended result. And you have to understand how you communicate, but you also have to understand that not every audience is going to hear you in the way you think they will. So if anything, you have to know and understand and do those kinds of audience assessments and analyses. And the thing that is a lesson that I learned probably a while ago is just because someone didn't hear you, see you, receive you in the way that you intended, it doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean your choreography was totally off, but it also doesn't mean they are wrong or they were bad. So if I ever thought that someone reacted in a bad way, the, the thing that I try to do as a, as a stop gap, if that happens, like let's say they send an email, I give that 24 hours before I respond to that email. And that's really good. And, and that can apply to a phone call. It can apply to any kind of reaction. And forget to listen to the other person or people because everyone has a perspective. We're not all going to be sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya anytime soon, but everyone has a perspective. And we're not wrong if we have a different perspective from someone else. Let's try to use it to all become better and fortify our brands and fortify our daily lives. So uh, I don't know if that answered your question, Rick, but yeah. you know, definitely it's about how you deliver, if nothing else. And if you're not ready to communicate in a productive way in any given day, try to stay home, try not to communicate 
because you're going to mess up more than you're going to do well. But I know everyone who is watching has unique differentiators that are good for society and that will make us all better. I want you to own that differentiator and just go out and own your wow. Say, um, we have your contact info in the comments field, but remind everybody about the various uh, ways that they can consume your content and, and keep up with you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Well, the ownyourwow.com website has all of our social platforms, but of course on Twitter, I'm just Rashini R. And I'd love for you to follow me there. I do uh, a lot of different things there. I share information. I tell you about what's coming up on my radio show, Real Talk with Rashini. Uh, please feel free to send me a LinkedIn invite. I'd love to uh, be part of your world. And then, of course, the Really Just with Rashini podcast. You can find that on Apple, Radio.com, Google Play, Stitcher. And uh, there's a lot of complimentary content also on the ownyourwow.com, whether it's uh, the blog or I've done some columns over the years on different powerful presence and media savvy. And we also have a lot of video and audio on there that should hopefully be helpful content. So you might find something on there that specifies one of your needs right now. Okay. Well, I really appreciate your time. I'm uh, going to ask you back because I'd, I'd like to look back at this period of time and maybe assess what, what, went, what went right, what went wrong. And so um, thank you for today. And we look forward to having you back. Thank you, Rick. I would absolutely love to do a debrief with you in the coming weeks.